still doesn't penetrate the ultimate mystery of, of uh, how consciousness can emerge, true subjectivity. We assume that each other are conscious, but uh, that assumption breaks down in the case of animals, and we'll have a you know, vigorous debate when we have these machines. But I'll make one point. Uh, we will, I'll make a prediction that we will come to believe these machines uh, because they'll be very clever and they'll get mad at us if we don't believe them and we won't want, we won't want that to happen, so thank you. Oh. Okay. So, David? Well, thank you for those very eloquent remarks. And I want to say, first of all, uh, many points were raised. Uh, the premise of John Searle's Chinese Room and of the uh, thought experiment, which is related, that I outlined, is certainly unrealistic. Uh, granted, the premise is unrealistic. That's why we have thought experiments. If the premise were not unrealistic, if it were easy to run in a lab, we wouldn't need to have a thought experiment. Now, the fact remains that when we conduct a thought experiment, any thought experiment needs to be evaluated carefully. The fact that we can imagine something doesn't mean that what we imagine is the case. We need to know whether our thought experiment is based on experience. Um, I would say the thought experiment of um, imagining that you're executing the instructions that constitute a program or that realize a virtual machine is founded on experience because we've all had the experience of executing algorithms by hand. It isn't any, and it, there's no exotic ingredient in executing instructions. Uh, I may be wrong. Uh, I don't know for sure what would happen if I executed a, a truly enormous program that went on for billions of pages. But uh, I don't have any reason for believing that, it, that consciousness would emerge. It seems to me a completely arbitrary claim. It might be true. Anything might be true. But I don't, I don't see why you make the claim. I don't see what makes it plausible. Uh, you mentioned massive parallelism. But massive parallelism, after all, adds absolutely zero in terms of expressivity. You could have a billion processors going, or 10 billion, or 10 trillion, or 10 to the 81st, and all those processors could be simulated on a single jalopy PC. I could run all those processes asynchronously on one processor, as you know, and what I get from parallelism is performance, obviously, and a certain amount of cleanliness and modularity when I write the program, but I certainly don't get anything in terms of expressivity that I didn't have anyway. Um, you mentioned um, consciousness, which is, which is the, the key issue here, and you pointed out uh, consciousness is uh, subjective. Uh, I'm only aware of mine, you're only aware of yours, granted. Um, you say that consciousness is an emergent property of a complex system. Uh, granted, of course, the brain is obviously a complex system, and consciousness is clearly an emergent property. Nobody would claim that one neuron tweezed out of the brain was conscious. So, yes, it is an emergent property. Uh, the business about animals and people denying animal consciousness, I haven't really heard that since the 18th century. But who knows, maybe this is, there are still Cartesians out there. Let me raise your hands. Um, but in the final analysis, although it's true that consciousness is irreducibly subjective, you can't possibly claim to understand the human mind if you don't understand consciousness. It's true that I can't see yours and you can't see mine. It doesn't change the fact that I know I'm conscious, you know that you are, and I'm not going to believe that you understand the human mind unless you can explain to me what consciousness is, how it's created and how it got there. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do a lot of useful things without being creating consciousness. You certainly can. If your ultimate goal is utilitarian, forget about consciousness. But if your goals are philosophical and scientific and you want to understand how the mind really operates, then you must be able to tell me how consciousness works or you don't have a theory of the human mind. Um, one element that um, I think you left out in your discussion of the thought experiment and, and the fact that, granted, we're able to build more and more complex systems and they are more and more powerful and we're able to build more and more accurate and effective simulations of parts of the brain and indeed of other parts of the body. Because keep in mind that when we allow the importance of emotion in thinking, it's clear that you don't just think with your brain, you think with your body. When you feel an emotion, when you have an emotion, the body acts as a resonator or a sounding board or an amplifier. And you need to understand how the body works as well as the brain does if you're going to understand emotions. But granted, we're, getting a we're able to build more complex and more and more effective simulators. What isn't clear is the role of the brain chemical structure, 
the role of the brain stuff itself, of course, is a point that, that Searle harps on, but it goes back to a paper by Paul Ziff in the late 1950s. Many people have remarked on this point. We don't have the right to dismiss out of hand the role of the actual chemical makeup of the brain in creating the emergent property of consciousness. Uh, we don't know whether it can be created using any other substance. Maybe it can and maybe it can. It's an empirical question. Uh, one is reminded of the famous search that went on for so many centuries for a substitute source of the pigment ultramarine. Ultramarine, a tremendously important pigment for any painter. Uh, you get it from lapis lazuli, and there are not very many sources of lapis lazuli. It's very expensive, and there's a big production number to get it and grind it down, turn it into ultramarine. So ultramarine paint used to be as expensive as gold leaf. People wanted to know, where else can I get ultramarine? And they went to the scientific community, and the scientific community said, we don't know. I mean, there's no law that says there is some other place to get ultramarine from lapis lazuli, but we'll try. And at a certain point in the late 19th century, a team of French chemists did succeed in producing a fake ultramarine pigment, which was indeed much cheaper than lapis lazuli. And the art world rejoiced. The moral of the story, if you can do it, great. But you have no basis for insisting on an a priori assumption that you can do it. I don't know whether there is a way to achieve consciousness in any way other than living organisms achieve it. Um, if you think there is, you've got to show me. I, I have no reason for accepting that a priori. And I think I'm finished. <laughs> I can't believe it. Everyone's, well, Ray, uh, uh, I, I think stay, stay up there, and we'll uh, now go back and forth. And so, Ray, maybe you want to answer that. So. <clears throat> I'm struggling as I listen uh, to your remarks, David, to really tell what uh, you mean by consciousness. And I've tried to distinguish these two different ways of looking at it. <clears throat> the objective view, which is, which is usually what people lapse into when they talk about consciousness. They talk about some neurological property or they talk about self-reflection, an entity that can create models of its own intelligence and behavior and model itself, uh, or run uh, what-if experiments in its mind, or have imagination thinking about itself and kind of transforming models of itself and this kind of self-reflection that is a consciousness, uh, or maybe it has to do with mirror neurons and that we can uh, empathize, that is to say, understand the conscious uh, or the, the emotions of somebody else. But that's all objective performance. And these, uh, our emotional intelligence, our ability to be funny or be sad or express a loving sentiment, those are things that the brain does. And I make the case that we are making progress, exponential progress, in understanding the human brain in different regions and modeling them in mathematical terms and then simulating them and testing those simulations. And, the precision of those simulations is, is gearing up, and uh, you know we can argue about the time frame. I think, though, you know, within a quarter century or so, we will have detailed models that and simulations that can then do the same things that the brain does, apparently, and we won't be able to really tell them apart. That is what the Turing test is all about, and that this machine will pass the Turing test. But that is an objective test. We can argue about the rules. Mitch Caper and I argued for three months about the rules. Turing wasn't very specific about them, but it is an objective test, and it's an objective property. So I'm not sure if you're talking about that or talking about the actual sense one has of, of feeling uh, your apparent feelings, uh, the subjective sense of consciousness. And so you talk about... Can, you I, could I answer yeah, that question? Um, you say there are two kinds of consciousness, and I think you're right. I think most people, when they talk about consciousness, th uh, think of something that's objectively uh, visible. Uh, as I said, for my purposes, uh, I, I want consciousness to mean mental states. Uh, mental state, specifically a mental state that has no external functionality. But that's still... Uh, you know that you are capable of feeling or being happy, you know, you're, you know you're capable of thinking of something good that makes you feel good, of, of thinking of something bad that makes you depressed, of thinking of something outrageous that makes you angry. You know you're capable of mental states that are uh, your property alone, as you say. They're but these mental Absolutely. states do have... That's what I mean by consciousness. But these mental states still have objective 
neurological correlates. And in fact, we now have means of where we can begin to look inside the brain with increasing resolution, which is like doubling in 3D volume every year, uh, to actually see what's going on in the brain. So sitting there quietly, thinking happy thoughts and making myself happy, you can, there are actually things going on inside the brain. We're, be, we're able to see them. And so now this supposedly subjective mental state is, in fact, becoming a, an objective uh, behavior. Not can I, can not, I comment on that? Yeah. And I, I, I think, you're, I think the, the idea that you're arguing with, with Descartes is a straw man approach. Uh, I don't think anybody argues anymore that, that the mind is a result of mind stuff, some intangible substance that has no relation to the brain. By arguing that consciousness is subjective, or I'm agreeing with you that consciousness is subjective, I'm certainly not denying that it's created by physical mechanisms. I'm not claiming that it's some magical or transcendental, transcendental metaphysical property. But that doesn't change the fact that in terms of the way you understand it and perceive it, your experience of it is subjective. Uh, that was your term, and I'm agreeing with you. And that doesn't change the fact that it is created by the brain. Uh, clearly, we're, re we're reaching better and better understandings of the brain and of everything else. Uh, you've, you've said that a few times, and I certainly don't disagree. Uh, the fact that we're getting better and better doesn't mean that necessarily we're going to meet, reach any arbitrary goal. It depends on our methods. It depends if we understand the problem the right way. It depends if we're taking the right route. Uh, it seems to me that consciousness is um, necessary. Unless we understand consciousness as a subjective phenomenon that we're all aware of, our brain simulators haven't really told us anything fundamental about well, the human mind. Well, I they think, haven't told us what I want to know. I think our brain simulators are going to have to work not just at the level of the Turing test, but at the level of measuring the objective neurological correlates of these supposedly internal mental states. And there's, there's some information processing going on when we daydream and we think happy thoughts or sad thoughts or worry about something. And uh, the, you know, there's the same kinds of things going on as when we do more visibly intelligent tasks. And we're, in fact, more and more able to penetrate that by seeing what's going on and modeling these different regions of the brain, including, say, the spindle cells and the mirror neurons, which are involved with things like empathy and emotion, and which are uniquely human, although a few other animals have some of them, uh, and really beginning to model this. We're at an early stage, and it's easy to sort of ridicule the primitiveness of today's technology, which will also always appear primitive compared to what will be feasible given the exponential progression. But these internal mental states are, in fact, objective behaviors, if we, because we will need to expand our definition of objective behavior to uh, the kinds of things that we can see when we look inside the brain. If I could comment on that. Um, I, if, if your tests are telling us uh, that they are unable to distinguish, that the, the same thing creates, on the one hand, a mental state of uh, shar sharply focused uh, in which I'm able to concentrate on a problem without my mind drifting and solving it, there's no way to distinguish that mental state from a mental state in which my mind is wandering, I'm unable to focus or concentrate on what I'm doing, uh, and then I start dreaming. In fact, cognitive psychologists have found out that we start dreaming and then we fall asleep. If your tests or your simulators are unable to distinguish between the mental state of, of dreaming or continuous free association on the one hand and focused logical analytic problem solving on the other, then I think you're just telling us that your tests have failed because we know that these states are different, and we want to know why they're different. Okay. It doesn't do any good to say, well, they're caused in the same way. We need to explain the difference that we can observe. Can I ask a question which I think gets at what this disagreement is? And I'll ask you two different questions. The question for David is, what would it take to convince you so that you would accept that you could build a conscious computer built on digital substrate? And Ray, what would it take to convince you ah, that digital stuff isn't good enough, we need some of the chemicals or something else that, that David talked about. Well, I mean, to answer it myself, uh, I wouldn't get too hung up on digital because, uh, in fact, the brain is not digital. It's th the neurotransmitters are kind of a digitally controlled analog phenomena. But 
when we figure out the salient, the important thing is to figure out what is salient and how information is modeled and what these different regions are actually doing to transform information. Uh, the actual neurons are very complex. There's lots of things going on, but we find out in the, you know, one region of the auditory cortex that it's basically conducting a certain type of algorithm. The information is represented perhaps by the location of certain neurotransmitters in relation to another, whereas in another case it has to do with the production of some unique neurotransmitter. I mean, there's different ways in which the information is represented, and these are uh, chemical processes, but but we can model really anything like that at whatever level of specificity is needed digitally, and we know that. We can, we can model okay, analog. Okay, so you didn't answer the question. Can you not answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will continue in exactly the same spirit by, <laughs> by not answering the question. I wish I could answer the question. It is a very good question and a deep question. How, uh, given the fact that, that mental states that are purely private are also purely subjective, how can we tell when they are present? And the fact is, it, uh, just as you don't know how to produce them, I don't know how to tell whether they are there. It's a research question. It's a philosophical question. It's, um, we know how to understand particular technologies. That is, you say, uh, I've created consciousness, and I've done it by running software on a digital computer. I can think about that and say, I don't buy that. I don't believe there's consciousness there. If you will in some other technology, my only stratagem is to try and understand that new technology. I need to understand what you're doing. I need to understand what moves you're making because unfortunately I don't know of any general test. The only test that one reads about or cares about philosophically is relevant similarity. That is, we assume that our fellow human beings are, are conscious because we can see they're people like us. We assume that if I had mental states, other Similar creatures have mental states, and we make that same assumption about animals, and the more similar to us they seem, the more we assume their mental states are like ours. Uh, how are we going to handle creatures who are, or things, or entities, objects, that are radically unlike us and are not organic? Uh, it's a hard question, an interesting question. Well, I'd like to see more some, work some ways, done on it. In some ways they'll be more like us than animals, because animals are not perfect models of, of humans, either medically or mentally. Uh, whereas as we really reverse engineer what's going on, the salient processes and learn what's important in the different regions of the brain and recreate those properties of, and abilities to transform information in similar ways and then get an entity that in fact acts very human-like and a lot more human-like than an animal, for example, can pass a Turing test which uh, involves mastery of language which animals basically don't have for the most part, uh, they will be closer to, to humans than animals are. I mean, if we really model, I mean, take an extreme case. I don't think this is necessary to model neuron by neuron and neurotransmitter by neurotransmitter, but you, one could, in theory, do that. And uh, we have, in fact, do have simulations of neurons that are highly detailed already of one neuron or a cluster of three or four. So why not extend that to 100 billion neurons? It's theoretically possible, and it's a different substrate, but it's really doing the same things, and it's closer to humans and animals are. So what, while think, David responds, if people who want to ask questions can come to the two microphones, but go ahead. Um, when you say acts, acts very human-like, uh, this is a key issue. You have to keep in mind that the Turing test is rejected by many people and has been from the very beginning as a superficial test of performance, a test that fails to tell us anything about mental states, fails to tell us the thing that we really most want to know. So when you say something acts very human-like, that's exactly uh, what we don't do when we attribute the presence of consciousness on the basis of relevant similarity. Uh, when I see somebody, if, even if he isn't acting human-like at all, if he's fast asleep, even if he's, uh, you know, if he's out cold, uh, I don't need to see him do anything. I don't need to have him answer any fancy questions on a Turing test. I can see he's a creature like I am, and I therefore attribute to him a mind and believe he's capable of mental states. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the Turing test, which is a test of performance rather than states of being, has, been, has certainly failed to convince people who are interested in what you would call the subjective kind of well, consciousness. I, well, I think that doesn't tell me anything about Well, it. now I think we're getting somewhere because I would agree the Turing test is an objective test, and you, you can argue about making it super rigorous and, and so forth, but... And if an entity passed that test, a super rigorous one, 
uh, it is really convincingly human. It's convincingly funny and sad, and we really uh, is really displaying those emotions in a way that we cannot distinguish from human beings. But but you're right. I mean, this gets back to a point I made uh, initially. Uh, sub that doesn't prove that that entity is conscious, and we don't absolutely know that other people are conscious. I think we will come to accept them, them as conscious. That's a prediction I can make. But fundamentally, this is, the, this is the underlying ontological question. There is actually a role for philosophy, because it's not fundamentally a scientific question. If, if you reject the, the Turing test or any variant of it, uh, then we, we're just left with this philosophical issue. My own philosophical take is if an entity seems to be conscious, I would accept its consciousness. But that's a philosophical, not a scientific position. So I think we'll take the first question. Remember, not a monologue, something to provoke discussion. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, let's see. What if everything is conscious and connected, and it's just a matter of us learning how to communicate and connect with it? <laughs> that, I mean, that's a good point, because you know we can communicate with other humans to some extent, although history is full of examples where we dehumanize uh, a certain, you know, uh, portion of the population and don't really accept their conscious experience or, uh, and we have trouble communicating with animals so that un really underlies the whole animal rights. I mean, What's it like to be a giant squid? Their, their behavior seems very intelligent and, but it's also very alien and we don't, there's no way we can even have the terminology to express that because it's not, uh, it, it's not experiences that are human and that is part of the deep mystery of consciousness and gets at the uh, subjective aspects of it, but as we do uh, really be, begin to model our own brain and then extend that to other species, as we're doing with the genome, we're now trying to reverse engineer the genome and other species, we'll do the same thing ultimately with the brain. That will give us more insight. We can translate into our own human terms uh, the kinds of uh, mental states as we can see them uh, manifest, uh, as we really understand how to model uh, other brains. If we think we are communicating with a software-powered robot, we're kidding ourselves because we're using words in a fundamentally different way. To use an example that Turing himself discusses, we could ask the computer or the robot, do you like strawberries? And the computer could, uh, could lie and say yes, or it could, in a sense, tell the truth and say no. But the more <laughs> fundamental issue is that not only does it not like strawberries, it doesn't like anything. Uh, it's never had the experience of liking. It's never had the experience of eating. It doesn't know what a strawberry is or any other kind of berry or any other kind of fruit or any kind of other kind of food item. It doesn't know what liking is. It doesn't know what hating is. It's using uh, words in a purely syntactic way uh, with no meanings behind well, well, this, this is now the Searlean argument. And, I've, and John Searle's argument can be really rephrased to prove that the human brain has no understanding and no consciousness because, I mean, each neuron is just a machine. Instead of just shuffling symbols, it's just shuffling chemicals, and obviously just shuffling chemicals around is no different than shuffling symbols around. And if shuffling chemicals and symbols around doesn't really lead to real understanding or consciousness, then why isn't that true for a collection of 100 neurons, which are all just little machines, or, a or 100 billion? a distinction, which is software. Software is the distinction. I can't download your brain on the computer. Well, that's there. just a limitation of my I, brain. I mean, we, don't have, <laughs> we don't have quick downloading ports. <laughs> no, that's something that biology left out. We're just not going to leave that out of well, our well, non-biological brain. It turns brains. out to be an important point. It's, it's, a, it's a, a limitation, issue. not... I, I think it's a very big difference whether I can take this computer and upload it to a million other computers or to machines that are nothing like this digital computer, to a Turing machine, to an organic computer, to an optical computer. I can upload it to a class full of freshmen. I can upload it to all sorts of things. But your mind is yours and will never be downloaded. That's just because we, we, we left... It's stuck to your brain. <laughs> we left out the... And I think that's a thought-provoking fact. I don't think you can just dismiss you're it as, pos a, you're posing as that a, as a, you know, a, a developmental accident, maybe it is. You're, you're, posing it, you're posing that as a benefit and an advantage of biological intelligence that we don't have these quick downloading ports to access information. not an information. advantage, it's just a fact. But that's not an advantage. I mean, if we added quick downloading ports, which we will add to our non-biological you know, brain emulations, uh, that's just an added feature. We could leave it out 
but we put it in there that doesn't deprive it of any you know, capability that it would otherwise have. You think you could upload your mind to somebody with a different body, with a different uh, environment, who did, had a different set of experiences, read a different set of books, feels things in a different way, has a different set of likes, responds in a different kind of way, and he, he had an exact copy of you? I think that's a naive idea. I don't think there's any way to upload your mind anywhere else and that lets you upload your entire being, including your body. Well, it's hard to upload to another person who already has a brain and a body that's, it's like trying to upload to a machine that's incompatible. But, uh, you know, ultimately we will be able to gather enough data on a specific brain and, and, uh, and simulate that, including our body and our environmental influences. Next question. Thanks. If we eventually develop a machine which uh, appears intelligent and let's say given the appropriate body so that it can you know, answer meaningful questions about how does a strawberry taste or something like that or whether it likes strawberries, uh, if, if we are wondering if this machine is actually experiencing consciousness the same way that we do, uh, why not just ask it? They'll presumably have no reason to lie if you haven't specifically gone out of your way to program that in. So. Well, that doesn't yeah. tell us anything, because we can ask it today. I mean, you can ask a character in a, in a video game, and it will say, well, I'm really angry, or uh, I'm sad, or whatever. And we don't believe it, because it doesn't, it's not very convincing yet, it doesn't, because it doesn't have the subtle cues, it's not as complex, and not a realistic emulation of... Well, if we built a thousand of them, let's say, presumably they went all agree to lie ahead of time. Somebody, you know, one of them might tell us the truth if the answer is no. All right, well, we'll, we'll finish that question. If you I can. strongly we'll agree. Um, uh, keep in mind that the whole basis of the Turing test is lying. The, uh, the computer is, is, is instructed to lie and pass itself all as a human being. Turing assumes that everything it says will be a lie. He doesn't talk about the real deep meaning of lying or he doesn't care about that and that's fine, that's not his topic. But he'd cer it's certainly not the case that the computer is in any sense telling the truth. It's telling you something about its performance, not something about facts or reality, or the way it's made, or what, it, what its mental life is like. I mean, John Searle, by the way, thinks that a snail could be conscious if it had this magic property, which we don't understand yet, uh, that causes consciousness. And when we figure it out, uh, you know, we may discover that snails have it. I mean, that's his view. So I do think that... Do you, you think know, it's inherently implausible that we should need a certain chemical to produce a certain result? You think chemical structure is irrelevant? No, but uh, we can simulate uh, chemical interactions. And we just simulated the other day something that people said, oh, we'll never be able to be simulated, which is protein folding. And we can now take an arbitrary amino acid sequence and actually simulate and watch it fold up and it's an accurate simulation. You understand so, it, but you don't get any amino acids out. As Searle points out, if you want to talk Surly, and you can simulate photosynthesis, no photosynthesis takes place. You can simulate a rainstorm, nobody gets wet. I mean, there's an important distinction. <laughs> Certainly, you're going to understand the process, but you're not going well, to if you simulate creativity, the result. You'll, if you simulate creativity, you'll get real ideas out. Okay, next, next uh, short. So up until this point, there seems to have been a lot of discussion just about, uh, you know, a fully uh, just software, just a human or whatnot. But I'm kind of curious your thoughts towards uh, more of a gray area, if it's possible, uh, where that is, you know, if we in some way augment the brain with some sort of electronic component or, you know, somebody has some sort of operation to add something to them. Uh, I, I don't think it's been done yet today, but just kind of, is it possible to have uh, fully, what you would consider to be a fully conscious human, take part of the brain out, say, replace it with something to do a similar function, and then uh, have, you know, obviously the person still survive. Is that person conscious? Well, is it? Well, is my, it abs thanks. absolutely. And uh, we've done things like that, which I'll mention. Uh, but I think, in fact, that, that is the key application, or one key application of this technology. We're not just going to create these super intelligent machines to compete with us from over the horizon. We're going to enhance our own intelligence, which we do now with the machines in our pockets. And when we put them in our bodies and brains, we'll enhance our bodies and brains with them. But uh, we are applying this for medical problems. I mean, you can get a pea-sized computer placed in your brain or place the biological neurons that started by Parkinson's disease. And in fact, the latest generation now allows you to download new software to your neural implant from outside the patient. And that uh, does replace the function of the corpus of biological neurons. 
And now you get biological neurons in the vicinity getting signals from its computer, where they used to get signals from the biological neurons, and this hybrid works quite well. And there's about a dozen neural implants, some of which are getting more and more sophisticated uh, in various uh, uh, stages of development. Uh, so right now we're trying to bring back uh, quote, normal function, although normal human function is, in fact, a wide range. But ultimately, we'll be sending blood cell size uh, robots to the bloodstream non-invasively to interact with our biological neurons. And that sounds very fantastic. I point out there's already four major conferences on blood cell size devices that can produce therapeutic functions in animals. And uh, we don't have time to discuss all of that, but uh, let's hit, let's hit we will. Um, when you talk about uh, technological interventions that to change the brain, uh, it's a remarkable, it's a fascinating topic, um, and it can do a lot of good, and one of the really famous instances of that is the frontal lobotomy, um, an operation invented in the 1950s and maybe the late 1940s, made people feel a lot better, uh, but somehow it didn't really catch on because it, uh, <laughs> it bent their personality out of shape, and so the the bottom line is not everything that we do, not every technological interve intervention that affects your mental states is necessarily going to be good. Now, it is a great thing to be able to come up with something that cures a disease, make somebody feel better. We need to do as much of that as we can, and we are. But uh, we, it's impossible to be too careful when you fool around with consciousness. You may make a mistake that you will regret. Well, and lobotomy cases are un undoable. I'm afraid this is going to be the last point, okay. last question. Um, how, how close do the brain simulation people uh, know they are to the right architecture and how do they know it? You, ma you made the assertion that you don't need to uh, uh, simulate the neurons in detail and that the IBM people are simulating a slice of neocortex and that's good and I think that is good but do they have a theory that says this architecture good, this architecture not good enough, how do they measure it? Well say in the case of the simulation of a dozen regions of the auditory cortex down on the west coast they've applied sophisticated psychoacoustic tests to the simulation they get very similar results as applying the same test to human auditory perception there's a simulation of the cerebellum where they apply skill formation tests it doesn't prove that these are perfect simulations but it does show it's on the right track and the overall performance of these regions you know appears to be doing uh, the kinds of things that we can measure uh, that, the, that the biological versions do. And uh, the scale and sophistication and resolution of these simulations is scaling up. The IBM one on the cerebral cortex is actually going to do it neuron by neuron and ultimately at the chemical level, which I don't believe is actually necessary when we ultimately to actually create those functions. When we learn the salient algorithms, we can basically implement them using our computer science methods more efficiently, but that's a very useful project to really understand how the brain works. Um, I'm all in favor of neural simulations. I, I think one should keep in mind that we don't think just with our brains. We think with our brains and our bodies. Ultimately, we'll have to simulate both. And we also have to keep in mind that unless our simulators can tell us not only uh, what the input-output behavior of the human mind is, but how it understands and how it produces consciousness, unless it can tell us where consciousness comes from, not enough to say it's an emergent phenomenon, granted, but how? How does it work? Unless those questions are answered, we don't understand the human mind. We only, we're kidding ourselves if we think otherwise. So with that, I think I'd like to thank both Ray and David for their <laughs>